Hey everyone, this is Pete, and welcome back to Atari A to Z, a series of short playthroughs of Atari 8-bit games, some which I grew up with and some which are new to me. Today is one of the latter. Today we're looking at Death Race, which was a 1987 release from Atlantis Software, developed by Simon Leck, who is credited as Sizz on the game's title screen. So Leck, or Sizz, developed several games for the budget-centric Atlantis software, including the 1988 maze game Cops and Robbers and the 1989 breakout clone Crack Up. Uh, Cops and Robbers in particular, along with Death Race, I remember not being received particularly well at the time of release. And part of the reason for this was that Atlantis' games were often criticised for looking fairly primitive compared to their contemporaries. 1987 was fairly late in the Atari 8-bit's lifespan, so a lot of developers were really able to bring out the best of the machine at that point and a lot of reviewers tended to think that Atlantis software weren't really pushing the Atari to its maximum potential. These days of course uh, we can judge these games on their own merits rather than unnecessarily comparing them to other things of the time. And we can also bear in mind the fact that these were games that were released on cassette for a budget price point, probably £1.99 or £2.99, the sort of thing you pick up with your pocket money in Smiths. And uh, if you sort of divorce these games from the context of the other stuff going on around them at the time, you can see that there's often some value in these. And in fact, Death Race is a pretty solid adaptation of Sega's 1981 arcade game Turbo, which otherwise we didn't really see any ports of to home computers. So with that in mind, let's go play Death Race. Okay, here we are with Death Race by Atlantis Software, by Sids, copyright 1987 Atlantis Software. Um, I vaguely remember this getting panned by Page Six magazine, um, but most of Atlantis' software's um, games got pretty panned at that point, because, as I said at the start, the trouble with a lot of these games is that they were very much behind the times. So, like, if this had come out four or five years earlier... It would have probably got praised especially because it's actually a pretty solid adaptation of turbo albeit without the corners um but as it stands at the time this came out there was much more in the way of interesting and exciting games available and so games like this and particularly cops and robbers one of the other ones that uh Sizz made um, were not particularly well received because at that point the Atari 8-bit was considered to be capable of better and maybe it is but well you know it's also capable of this and this is perfectly acceptable I mean, it's simple and it's straightforward. But there's absolutely nothing wrong with simple and straightforward. Consider, if you will, your average mobile phone game today. There are a lot of mobile phone games that are no more complicated than this. And in fact, in my eyes, a lot of them are worse than this because they'll bug you for microtransactions every five seconds. Oh, you seem to have run out of lives. Would you like to give us five pounds? Would you like to spend 72 pounds, best value, for a pack of exclusive boosts? Extended play. So the way this works, if you haven't worked it out already, um, you move the car at the bottom of the screen, left and right, dodging other cars on the road. You can push up and down to speed up and slow down. Um, and your aim is to try and pass as many cars as possible without crashing and try and continue until your time expires. So when the time expires, you get an extended play. Um, so it's unlike some racing games in that respect. Um, but you do have lives in this. So every time you crash, you lose a life. And if you run out of lives, that's what causes your game to end. I assume there's a minimum quota you have to pass as well. But I don't know. It doesn't seem to indicate that anywhere on the screen. So I, I wonder if there's anything stopping you just going very slowly and just passing a few cars to make it easier to survive until the end of the time limit so let's continue going at this speed here and see see how we end up so 
So the thing I really like about this game, and one thing that did get highlighted in some of the reviews, is the the changing scenery. Because there weren't many racing games that did that at this time. You tend to have... If there, were, if there were multiple tracks, you might have different graphics off in the distance. Um, but you tended not to go through different... Oops! You tended not to go through different locales as you were racing. There are only a few examples of games that actually did that, with one of them being Activision's uh, The Great American Cross Country Road Race, in which the whole point of that game was going on a big road trip whole point of that game is going on a big road trip across the United States and stopping off in various famous locations. Um, and one of the things that game did as you were driving around is it had a day-night cycle. Um, you'd arrive in new towns and you'd sort of... It did this really cool kind of coming over the crest of a hill effect whenever you arrived in a new city. So you'd sort of see the city skyline gradually appearing over the horizon. And it really gave you a sense of achievement. Well, this is... <laughs> no one wants to use the left lane, huh? Alright. Accelerate! Oh, no, there we go. I knew I was going to come a cropper at some point. Still, that's probably more than enough cars. Yeah, Great American Cross Country Road Race is not one we've covered on this series yet, but it's one we'll definitely have to have a look at at some point, because it's a, a real Activision classic. Um, it's actually the... I don't know if it's ever sort of officially acknowledged as the sequel to Enduro, um, but but it is the sequel to Enduro, basically. It's, it's very obvious. Because it's the same sort of game structure as Enduro. It uses a lot of the same graphical effects, but obviously better because it's on the Atari 8-bit and not the Atari 2600. But yeah, it's a, it's a game I didn't get my head around as a kid because I didn't understand what gear changes were. <laughs> but we'll talk more about that when we come to actually look at it in detail. As for this, I'm starting to suspect we might have a sort of endless endless game here, unless it really does get significantly harder. But there'll be a point at which it can't go any faster and it can't fit any more cars on screen. At which point, I guess in theory, we could just keep playing forever. But we won't. I will deliberately start taking more risks at that point if that looks set to happen. Which it is already looking fairly set to happen. And we get an extra life every time we uh, get an extended play as well. So, let's accelerate a bit. Take a few more chances. As the more cars we pass, the more points we get. So yeah, this is obviously very much a score attack game rather than a time attack game. Yeah, I can't think of many other racing games where it's actually desirable to let the time run out. Because the usual format for racing games is get to a particular place by a particular time. Whereas in this one, it's more survive for as long as you can. And score as many points as you can along the way. I guess that's kind of in keeping with the game name, though. I mean, it is called Death Race. So it makes sense that it would be a race for survival. Whoops! Maybe it is getting harder. I don't know, though. I love the speedometer in the corner. Just it. At this time, no one had any concept of accurately simulating speed. And so they were like, yeah, you're going 254 miles per hour. Obviously. 
Because it's the far future, and you're in a death race. When in fact, if scenery was going past at this rate, in reality, you'd probably be going like 40 or 50 miles an hour. And we have the pole position problem again, in which the sides of the road are moving at a different rate to the trackside objects. <laughs> because we hadn't really figured out 3D. And the entire way that that 3D effect on the road is being created is simply through cycling colours. And it's not quite in sync with the sprites. But it's, it's not a bad effect. It's not a bad effect. It's certainly, certainly more than your average trackside detail for a racing game of this era. It's just a bit of a shame that there's no sort of additional hazards being introduced. Like all we've got is the, the cars come a little bit more frequently. And even then, like I say, there's a, a limit to how much of a challenge that that becomes. So it would have been nice to see some corners and stuff, but probably difficult to implement with the amount of trackside detail that there is going on. Or just some, just some other hazards in the road. Like some, some oil slicks that would make you spin out, or uh, like water that would slow you down, or something like that. So all, all your typical 80s racer hazards. But as it stands, yeah, this isn't this isn't a terrible game. I mean, it's not an amazing game or anything, but I don't think it deserved to be panned because you have to remember that Atlantis was a very budget-centric publisher, which meant that they released games on cassette. For one pound ninety nine, just sort of real pocket money territory, even even back in nineteen eighty six. And so these games weren't designed to be huge sprawling masterpieces that you'd spend hours on at a time. Despite the fact that this took seventeen minutes to load, according to the cassette inlay, the Atari's uh, cassette loading system was a notorious weak point. If you're not familiar. It's, it's very interesting, because I, I, I didn't really know this until quite recently, but the Commodore 64 and the Spectrum load stuff from tape surprisingly quickly. It's like you always joke about putting a cassette on and waiting, going and having your dinner while your game loads. Oh, I've actually maxed out the number of cars I can pass. Well, I guess that answers that, if it's going to get any more difficult. <laughs> but yeah, like I say, I, I didn't know until quite recently that the Commodore 64 and the Spectrum loaded stuff from cassette way faster than the Atari did. I'm not sure of the... 100% sure of the technical reasons behind it, but it's something to do um, with the data transfer rate. And thus, presumably, the amount of data that was contained in the audio information on a cassette. And how quickly the Atari was able to process that. I don't think it was an issue with the the actual I.O. interface on the Atari, because that was sort of quite well regarded as, in, in many ways, the precursor to USB. It was a, a sort of universal input-output interface that you could connect all sorts of things to. You could connect... Um, disk drives and, and tape decks are the main thing that, that people used it for but you could also connect printers and modems and all sorts of things to that one port and then daisy chain them together so if you were using your computer for more sort of serious applications you could have this kind of hub of peripherals but yeah cassette loading was a notorious weak point of the Atari so I guess one thing you have to bear in mind when you're looking at a game like this is that yes, although it's fine now to sort of boot up in an emulator and have a quick rag on just loading it from a executable file almost instantly 
back in the day, although it was only one pound ninety nine, would you have wanted to spend seventeen minutes loading this game to maybe play it for five, and then think, uh, I can't be bothered to play that again? And this is why, if you have a retro computer, I highly recommend getting a disk drive or some sort of alternative solution that uses SD cards, which is what is fashionable to do today. I still have a soft spot for disk drive, so I grew up with the sound of five and a quarter inch floppy disk drives on my Atari 8-bit, and uh, thus, whenever I have the option of how to load something, if the option to load it from disk is available, I will take that option. Anyway, yeah, I think we've pretty much exhausted the possibilities of this game. Like I say, it's, it's, it's not a bad game. There's just not a lot to it, really. And as I say, I don't, I don't really think it was necessarily worth being panned like it was. But also, at the same time, it's not exactly a classic either. And I think part of the reason for it being panned is if you consider when Turbo originally came out in the arcades, that was the early 80s, and this came out in, what was it, 86, 87? Other games in the genre had very much moved on by that point, so we had much better racing games available. And so this would have looked a little bit primitive. But no matter, it is what it is. And what it is, is... Eh, it's alright. <laughs> I think if you were a fan of Turbo in the arcades, you would have been happy with this. Because it, it is a solid adaptation. Like I say, it's a, it's a shame that we don't have the corners and stuff, but the... The interest in the trackside scenery and the, the variation in the areas that you drive through. And just the fact that the gameplay is a fairly solid adaptation of the turbo formula. It's just a shame it doesn't really get any harder. It's like here we are once again having maxed out the car counter. And then having to wait for it to count down all of that bonus. I'm just going to flat out in the next course. Because this, this needs to end at some point. We're not having another onslaught situation. I would like this game to end while I still moderately like it. <laughs> right, full speed, 300 miles an hour. Go, go, go! You know what? The trouble is, I'm too good at video games. I'm just too good. I'm literally amazing at Death Chase. Unbeatable. The absolute best, apart from when that happened, but... Petition for next year's Desert Bus for Hope to be replaced with Death Chase. Games like this would probably make a good charity stream, actually. How long can your sanity take of a game like this? And how long will people sit around watching you with your brain slowly melting? Oh no! Only one life left. Could all be over soon, ladies and gentlemen. And I'm sure you're waiting for that to happen. Once again, flat out. 300 miles per hour! Fantastic Voyage flashbacks. 
That boop is very similar to the uh, the heart monitor in Fantastic Voyage. Oh, my eyes are going funny. <laughs> I'm getting that thing where you stare at something for quite a while and it starts to feel like a magic eye picture. <laughs> Oh, this is going to plow me straight into the back of that blue car, isn't it? I'm ready. I'm ready. No, I'm not. <laughs> I looked away just as the bonus finished bonusing. And yes, bonusing is a verb. I bonus, you bonus, he she it bonuses, we bonus. I'm on 300 miles an hour. They should have like increased the maximum speed with each passing level or something like that. Oh no! I'm dead, it's all over. 177,541 points. Beat that, if you will. Can you actually... Level 1, level 2, level 3, level 4, level 5. Is this just that... No, I'm not going to play a whole game. I'm just curious to see what turning it up to level 5 does. Whoa! Okay, that's harder. Yeah, that's much more difficult. And much also much more likely to make your eyes go funny. Uh, but anyway, I think I think we'll leave that there for now because I'm not sure I can take any more of that. But anyway, that is Death Race from Atlantis Software. Um fun if you like Turbo. Uh, if you don't like Turbo or you've no idea what Turbo is, then I don't know. Worth a look. Maybe maybe don't play it on level 1 though because it's a little bit easy. Anyway, that is that for today. As always, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you again next time.